Good morning all. Uh, very pleased that you are able to join us and a warm welcome to the first ever annual conference in virtual mode. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Wilfred Otten. I'm professor at Soil Biophysics at Cranfield University, but also the past president of the British Society of Soil Science. Today's annual conference is entitled Soil in Action. We have four fantastic presenters lined up for you over the next three hours or so, who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise within their areas of their work. As I'm sure you're all aware, tomorrow is World Soil Day, and this year's theme is Keep Soil Alive, Protect Soil Biodiversity. World Soil Day is held annually on December the 5th to focus attention on the importance of healthy soil and to advocate for sustainable management of soil resources. I'm sure you'll see many activities on social networks about this starting up already. This year's theme aims to raise awareness of the importance of sustaining healthy ecosystems and human well-being. As our members know, plants nurture a whole world of creatures in the soil that in return feed and protect the plants. The diverse community of living organisms keep the soil healthy and fertile. This vast world constitutes soil biodiversity and determines the main biogeochemical processes that make life possible on Earth. By encouraging people ac across the world to engage in proactively improving soil health, the Food and Agriculture Organization's campaign also aims to fight soil biodiversity loss. The four speakers today will discuss their connection with soil and the importance it holds within their work or research area. Before we begin with the presentations, a few basic housekeeping rules. As there are so many of you here today, all microphones have been muted. We will be taking questions at the end of Lorna's presentation and then at the end of Martin, Alexandra's and John's presentations. My colleague Dan will ask these on your behalf. So please could you submit any questions you have for Lorna by 10.40 and by 12.20 for the following three presenters to allow us to get time, allow us enough time to get through these questions. Although there is a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the presenter specifically asks you to show for a show of hands. Today's conference has also been awarded BASIS and NROSO CPD points. If you are registered with either body, please get in contact with the society after the event. Finally, please be aware that we are recording most of today's presentations. So over the next hour, we look forward to hearing from three invited speakers with different backgrounds. Just a reminder that we will be taking questions at the end of all three presentations and after a short comfort break. So please submit your questions as the presentations go on and our colleague Dan will gather them together again and present them on your behalf. Our first speaker, which I'm happy to introduce, is Martin Ballard, who has been invited to speak to you today by our, by our professional practice committee. Martin is the Group Environment Manager of Wilman Dixon, where his role is to ensure the sustainable practices and targets set for site performance are being consistently embedded and delivered. He leads an environment team on legal assurance, environmental protection and promotion of environmental improvement. Martin was previously Anglian Waters Performance Manager in construction and supply chain where he developed and embedded new approaches to carbon reduction, plus water, waste, and environmental management across several frameworks with suppliers. He has experience of delivering on waste, water, and carbon reduction, as well as strategic stakeholder and supply chain engagement, for example, on biodiversity, surface water, and sustainable urban drainage controls. Looking forward to this talk, over to you, Martin. Very good. Thank you very much for that welcome, Wilfred, and wonderful to be with you all today. Um, hopefully you can see uh, my presentation. Yeah. Very good. OK, uh, so with with that introduction, I should also add that I'm here in capacity uh, for the Society for the Environment, 
uh, for whom I'm the chair of the Soil and Stones Task Group. Um, so I, I thank both the Society for the opportunity to speak with you and my employer, Wilmot Dixon, who are a chartered environmentalist employer champion uh, for me being able to uh, join you today. Um, the, the context um, being that uh, in discussions with my colleagues across the industry and with the Society uh, for the Environment, it was clear that um, perhaps the spotlight on the risk compliance issues and also the opportunities of better reuse of soil and stones within the sector, but also the issues that the sector faces uh, with soil and stone misuse um, between different sectors was something that we ought to, to collaborate on um, and better understand. And so I put that uh, uh, issue to the Society for the Environment, so which in, inevitably the gauntlet was, was passed back of, well, yeah, if you'd like to take this on, how about seeing about uh, other chartered environmentalists across the spectrum that the Society um, uh, covers and uh, seeing about whether there's a common issue. Um, so with some just a little bit of bit of context and background of, of myself, um, uh, I've spent a lot of time with soil and stone in different guises. Um, one, you know, trying to uh, carefully plough uh, fields as a as a late teenager, early early twenties something, um, doing a pretty bad job in the West Country on some farms there uh, with family and friends. Um, but it uh, it kept me uh, going and gave me a good introduction to, uh, to to managing some finances and getting myself through university. During which time I spent uh, with the National Rivers Authority, uh, as it was in the day, now the Environment Agency, uh, mainly in the southwest, um, uh, looking at pollution control uh, and uh, and sampling uh, practices. Um, uh, and then I, off the back of university, I joined Anglian Water where I was ops manager on the Humber Bank um, and creating uh, the black matter on a field there spread. It was an old, old photo, that one, but uh, um, that's what activated sludge biosolids looks like. And my thoughts overnight are in particular with colleagues uh, and their friends and family in uh, Avonmouth with the disaster that's clearly happened uh, at the wastewater treatment uh, biosolids plant there. And my thoughts and heart really goes out to to them uh, at this time of year in particular. Um, but they create a valuable product um, for us to reuse and supplement uh, agricultural soil, in particular where nitrogen and phosphorus is in in low um, or, or in high demand, where it's particularly low, um, uh, is a, is a good additive. So it's, it's definitely not a, a fertilizer, but it's a good additive. And that then leads to the, the image on the right where, you know, from a, a Wilmot Dixon perspective and many uh, uh, contracting uh, companies across the construction sector, um, as a company, Wilmot Dixon tends to do work within the built environment, but occasionally, and in this case, we were employed um, to uh, build the first phase for the Bister Eco Village. Um, uh, and uh, you know, green development incorporation of housing uh, and retail within the existing landscape. So protection of the watercourse through the middle, badger set off to the off to the left, um, uh, retention of existing hedgerows and, uh, uh, and and woodland as part of that. Uh, but the careful management and the reuse of soil, uh, the topsoil retention, uh, the subsoil reuse to to form the levels. Uh, as part of that development. Um, and here's some, some other examples of what we might get involved in. So uh, the left, the uh, project that we've got going on in Daresbury at the moment, um, uh, the uh, the subsoil and, and topsoil clearly uh, visible there, uh, left being the uh, the top and uh, on the right, the uh, the sub um, for reuse as part of the master plan. But you know, careful stockpiling to make sure that uh, the toes of the uh, of the stockpiles don't um, overlap, um, that there's a clear drainage gap between um, and uh, well stocked that it's not going to run, uh, well compacted that it's not going to run off. But likewise, top right corner, we do find some hazardous matter in the ground and it's, it's essential that we sheet that and make sure that uh, 
uh, those contaminants are well managed, as you can see there, probably top right, uh, an old oil uh, fuel tank as, as part of that development that was unearthed, uh, clearly not in any any charts or maps as part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the plans, but it's been identified, it's then how we respond to that um, uh, hidden uh, risk and liability, and that's obviously clearly taken off on that particular development for um, uh, off-site management. But in many cases in the bottom right, we do have to, we have the opportunity to uh, segregate the soil and stone, uh, manage that in terms of crushing it and reusing it to a, an engineering standard, um, and then reusing that material back on the site of origin. Um, so converting it from a waste material on the right through the crusher as a material for reuse to engineering and environmental standards. Um, but in, in many cases, the material that comes out of the ground uh, could be a waste. And in this case, um, it's actually you know, some very good uh, uh, sandy gravels that would generally be termed hoggins uh, within the infrastructure industry. And hoggins is used as backfill for, uh, for pipelines um, so as it can seat and bench the, uh, the pipe and then cap over. Um, now, the, the, the question is, clearly, that could be a material. Um, um, but actually, as soon as it comes out of the ground, it is a waste. And this was, you know, a, uh, a common issue for many within the sector, their recognition of what is a waste or a material and how to manage it in both the correct manner legally, um, uh, but, but also make sure that we're compliant with the reuse of that material in the right place through the right process. And that's a, a common um, uh, issue of uh, unintended misuse or um, uh, intended. Um, uh, and in many cases, there is a gray line there. So careful uh, management of, of how material is, is imported and reused is really essential. And um, often uh, that is uh, either misunderstood uh, or not managed to the correct uh, standard. And, and in many cases, uh, we can then inadvertently be at risk of importing waste uh, that's mixed or blended in with the recycled stone or, or within the uh, recycled soils. Um, uh, and it might have particulates of, uh, of, of fines, asbestos or other contaminants that are difficult to deal with for some and are blended in with good material and then sold on as, uh, as, as a product when in, in fact they aren't. So the continuous testing and sampling making sure that the certificates match with the material provided is an ongoing challenge for the sector and absolutely fascinating to hear Lorna's earlier presentation and the science that's available. Clearly the technology and knowledge is there but the cost and the, man the way to manage that sustainably within the sector it is needed, a really cost effective way um, both to increase the knowledge of the challenge but also to help the sector manage that um, for every movement that's that's made. Um, so in, in terms of the aggregates quality protocol, we, ha we have quality protocols, we have codes of practice. Uh, for aggregates, it's very clear that it, it will be a waste as soon as it's created, as soon as it's dug or as soon as the building's dropped um, in demolition. It's the evidence that's needed to demonstrate that it's been then processed as a material. And the, the aggregates quality protocol is very clear as to what that evidence is. The challenge is for the industry is, is that applied consistently? And is that evidence available for every uh, load of material moved? And um, often that's not the case. Some of the, uh, the other challenges that we um, provide uh, or that, that we have on the, uh, uh, within the sector is provided on the agenda today as well. Um, with the change in storm patterns and the impact of runoff risk from sites and how that's then managed and contained um, provides a, uh, a clear and in this case a very visible um, uh, consequence that uh, was fortunately contained and managed. Um, so the, the, the context of um, the, uh, the, the challenge that the task group um, uh, has is how to understand the whole hierarchy of, of waste and how to push the lean engineering further up the value chain 
to make sure that we prevent that waste arising, that it's, it's designated as a material at the earliest possible chance within the design and, uh, uh, and pre-construction chain, um, that we reduce the, uh, the waste arising or designate it as material for reuse. And after that, it's beyond the, the line. And we're then into the realms of reliance of recycling either on site uh, for, for processing on site for then reuse or recycling off site. And I'll, I'll give some examples in, in a moment. Obviously, there is much material that we can't recycle. Uh, and then it goes into a recovery uh, mechanism, either as hazardous waste or uh, ultimately landfill, which is the worst case position. But fundamentally within the sector, what needs to be understood is that every bucket dug of soil and stone is a waste unless it is treated with good planning ahead of that and designated as a material uh, with the res regulator. But often the sector um, refers to the material as muck away. And this is a, an image uh, from one um, uh, uh, supply partner's website, but you know, it could be many that are out there. Um, in reality, this is muck. Um, this is you know, a good uh, farm, farmyard uh, manure. And that is exactly the legal definition uh, for the European Waste Code or the list of waste code, whichever you'd you'd rather use in terms of terminology. Um, construction deals with soil and stone, 170504. And somehow we need to move away from this uh, rather lazy language of muck away um, and work towards soil and stone. Because if we don't, then the sentencing council guidelines for environmental offences are very clear and, and potentially quite harmful. If there's a level of harm um, of either a, a, an observation, uh, a minor impact, significant or substantial, if there's a degree of culpability, i.e. there hasn't been a robust system uh, applied or there's negligence, or indeed it could be on the worst end of the scale, reckless or deliberate and intended, um, despite the aggravating and mitigating circumstances of a particular scenario uh, and the courtroom uh, examples were well given earlier, then the impact of the offender's turnover, so the organisation involved, then dictates a hierarchy of matrices of some significant eye-watering uh, sums um, that could be applied. And what's interesting is that the environmental sentences that have gone through the courts, certainly for the water and wastewater industries on the, the, the um, the cases that have come forward have been 10 times greater than the, uh, the uh, uh, equivalent potentially under the safety legislation. So uh, the, the environmental impact through the courts is far greater and therefore the attention needs to be far sharper uh, for, for everybody involved in the value chain uh, associated with, uh, with soil and stone to ensure that the legal offences uh, um, uh, are mitigated, or at least the uh, a greater understanding of the potential consequences of the law um, are, are well known because the fines are unlimited potentially, and there are um, uh, hefty uh, custodial sentences up to five years involved as well. Um, there's also a double jeopardy to all of this, in particular with soil and stone, that if the soil has been placed in an unpermitted place, then um, the uh, HMRC can recover the landfill tax for that as well. So not only can the environmental regulator uh, make their play uh, for fines uh, and uh, recovery through the courts, but HMRC can independently recover the landfill tax that would be due for the volume that's been misplaced. Uh, and that, as you could imagine, uh, would be significant based on the tonnage rates there. So it's quite easy and simple in many ways that um, there is a mechanism in place, has been since 2008, um, and it's called the Definition of Waste Code of Practice, which is managed by CLARE, which is the organisation, a not-for-profit organisation of which Wilmot Dixon is a, a long-standing partner member, um, that helps the development industry and the uh, soil uh, recovery um, sector 
uh, in designating material for, for reuse. Um, I'll, I'll come on to this a bit, bit, um, a bit later uh, in terms of the task group's considerations, but here, here's an example of some good chalk grounds that was unearthed on one of Wilmot Dixon's sites uh, in High Wycombe and then provided the base rock for, if you know the, the High Wycombe area, the leisure centre and uh, the Waitrose uh, store that we built um, uh, just uh, uh, 10 kilometres uh, away from this site. So it's a good example where fortunately two sites in close proximity came up and we were able to use um, good uh, subsoil between one site to the other. Um, and what's most important with uh, the reuse of material is the tracking of it, um, where the pockets of uh, material are, and you can see those numbered uh, one to nine on the left hand side of the image, uh, where they're moved to um, in the uh, uh, top uh, uh, right image, um, so as that the foundations are formed, um, uh, and then where they're stockpiled back to. So there's a there's a history on this particular site. Um, in the northeast of the country, um, where we can uh, identify uh, the areas of, uh, of contaminant, the areas of good material for reuse, segregation of those, and the control of those through the, the code of practice. And in that case, that material was reused on the site of origin, but that's not always the case. And then, you know, there's other opportunities where. Um, uh, material that's not heavily contaminated can be washed off site and reprocessed and then sold back to the market as a as a material. Uh, it could be treated with bioremediation uh, or other technologies um, uh, off site stored and sold on. Um, it, there's a particular sites for bioremediation as well, um, or it could end up as a transfer station and uh, and processed. And that's this is where um, we get into the greyer areas uh, and the potential cross contamination and resell uh, if we're if we're not careful. Now that material might end up as as landfill, and ho hopefully it does because it's unlikely to be a good uh, a good material for reuse. Um, uh, but it could, it could if if it's mishandled end up in the wrong place. Now clearly landfills do need materials, uh, a, a soil and stone to line their cells, to cap their cells. And invariably, a lot of good material um, that could be reused is often uh, in demand by landfills purely to, to line and cap. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's very important that we understand where the soil is going and how it's then managed uh, onwards. Um, and, and this is where the, over, the overlap with other land management um, uh, demands could lead to, to the misplacement. And, and hence, with all of that background and concern that the construction sector's got, um, it really led to the Soil and Stone Task Group being formed. And um, the initial question that was posed to members of the task group, and I'm delighted to be representing them, who uh, uh, are, are um, 36 uh, chartered environmentalists from across uh, all sectors that the society covers uh, with forestry, agricultural use, educational professorships um, and colleagues from uh, Cranfield and other universities uh, represented in, in the group, as well as uh, colleagues from the waste industry, the remediation and construction sectors. And really through, through those conversations, we did come to a consensus that we need to see a, a shift of perception and language of soil and stones from muck to a, a good material and if we can get that thinking right then perhaps we've got the opportunity of better custodianship and sustainable reuse and ensuring that we protect valuable uh, uh, soils uh, in situ um, in areas where uh, we've got um, greater importance for soil biodiversity, health and it's great that this, this topic is clear within the agricultural environment bills uh, and, and moving into the acts now. Um, uh, the, but what we do need is better tracking of the material and the resource and a clearer visibility of the circular economy. Um, and so there's many common issues and opportunities that we've identified 
given that the way that the legislation has evolved um, and within the regulatory bodies that have evolved with that have been uh, siloed in many ways um, uh, rather than a cohesive um, strong um, uh, view of the material the soil and stone that's belief beneath our feet um, uh, that uh, we need to protect protect for perpetuity and therefore needing a strong uh, independent auditory body that uh, that helps us manage that so that's some of the the initial views coming through from the the groups and we we looked as a task group at the quality protocols and the code of practice and we really tested ourselves and said well if we did away with these what would be the threats uh, or the opportunities or indeed the weaknesses or the strengths of doing away with the the, the code of practices and, and, the, and the qps the the um protocols quality protocols and you know what might be the opportunities if these were to be applied um beyond the construction sector and you can see the thinking uh here really there's no uh, you know in terms of a weakness there's there's no obvious um uh, weakness with them um there's 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 potential for alignment and, and greater uh use um the the DAOCOP is a voluntary mechanism it's not legislative but if it weren't followed then in effect uh Claire who manages it almost acts as a, a pseudo regulator in, in in many ways um so there's an independence there that helps with a uh, a legislative um consistency um clearly the threats if we were to do away with this is you know that the sham recovery that that clearly does happen and we need to keep guarded against that there's a far greater risk without a mechanism in place that that would be more prevalent uh, and then a, a greater burden on the environment on the regulators and on other sectors with that uh, that waste uh, coming their way so plenty of opportunities of of greater involvement collaboration avoidance of uh, uh of, of misuse and you know this is where the you know the view really came from well look is there a greater um uh, source framework uh, directive type approach that might come and so within three uh, sorry four subgroup uh themes we've really fleshed out some of the thinking um uh and and then drawn out um the knowledge of what happens now for the beneficial reuse of soil that um there is a good mechanism it's weak in that it's great for anything over 10,000 tons, but there's this middle region between 1,000 and 10,000 that it could be simpler and help uh, the many smaller uh, organisations within the sector be more effective at managing it. Uh, uh, and there's there's clearly a need for uh, a better consistency um, of how the materials management planning process operates with all parties involved. And how we can move waste more effectively for beneficial use as a as a non-waste um there's a number of of common opportunities that we've given some detail to and i'm i'm not going to go through these in, in a great detail now this is a bit of a teaser for the report that's going to come out in the new year um but clearly there's a review a critical need for for review of how we regulate and how we operate uh, a need for soil framework uh thinking and bring all of the uh, the regulatory uh, consistency together uh, because there's clearly inconsistencies of exemptions between different sectors which then lend itself to operators inadvertently or uh, intending to misuse uh, between sectors um, so you know there's some thinking there and and in terms with the uh, how we can reuse material more effectively there's clearly a need for banking and longer term storage uh, and on the continent within the EU, there's a grand banque approach um, that would clearly help it, but that would need better planning and land ownership commitment to make up that space within, you know, 20 miles, uh, 20 to 40 miles, anything more than that, and it's uneconomical to move a very costly, heavy resource. Uh, so it, it's got to be with, you know, a, a matrix of these uh, these these spaces across the country. Um, but clearly we need to use better use of, of the technologies and intelligence that's out there and plow that back into and share it between sectors to better understand soil diversity and the quality and how we have a common understanding of soil between all sectors um, 
that we share and benefit from the case studies of good practice and good land management. And I've, I've had early conversations with the NFU about how their soil guidance within the, um, uh, the, the agricultural fraternity could be shared uh, and we gain consistency and approach uh, with um, the construction sector, especially with the perils of, uh, of soil runoff um, that uh, uh, afflict both, uh, both sectors. And so there's an opportunity of training and support, common standards, common approaches that we could have. And, and perhaps with all of this, uh, an information platform, a one place that can signpost all of this guidance and options and, and management action. Uh, and the imperative with this, just to, to bring us around to a close, is you know the SD goals give us a great framework uh, of which all of us across the soil um, uh, sectors, and there's there's many of us, whether it's food production or or land use management or construction and engineering, we all have a part to play in each of these, and it would be great uh, within our our soil fraternity that we map. Um, the, uh, the, our inputs to each of these and have a matrix view as to each part that we play and we can therefore collaborate off that mapped approach um, just by having visibility. Um, and you know, I guess a call to action for us today uh, with um, the great uh, video that's been shared uh, on uh, World Soil Day uh, really calls to action the, the love from me, I think, for a, for you know, the time that um, uh, Professor David um, Bellamy gave us, the love in me for soils, uh, how we can share that love across this, this matrix platform um, uh, as a result of today would be, would be really encouraging. So thank you very much for the time and opportunity to speak with you. And I think um, there'll be a chance for some questions later. Uh, Wilfred, back to you. Thank you very much, Martin, for excellent presentation about the reuse and preventing of abuse of soils and stones. We're a little bit behind uh, schedule and we have uh, anticipate questions to be asked at the end of uh, the next presentations. So we hope to see you back at that point, Martin, and we'd like to continue now with our next presentation and next speaker. So our next speaker is Alexander Wadu, who has been invited by our European Journal of Soil Science editor, Jenny Dunkate. The European Journal of Soil Science is one of two journals published in partnership with Wiley by the British Society of Soil Science. If you haven't looked at this yet and haven't published in it, you have lost out. So take a look at that and consider your next paper for that journal. Jenny highlighted Alexandra's paper, Efficient Sampling for Geostatistical Surveys, which was published in February 2019 as one she felt of particularly interest to our members. Alexander is a research associate in soil science and pedometrics at the University of Sydney. He has made contributions to soil science through the development of quantitative methods for soil sampling, mapping and assessment using geostatistics, statistical learning algorithms and spectroscopy. Recent works have focused on understanding how much and why dynamic soil properties like pH, soil carbon, vary in space and in time, and what are the main drivers of soil biodiversity in Australia. Alexander holds an MSc in soil science from Tübingen, an MSc in epistemology from Nantes, and a PhD from Wageningen University. Over to you, Alexander. So I uh, guess you can hear me now, and yes, maybe we can. you can see the presentation, right? So thank you for this very nice introduction. Um, greetings from Sydney. Here is 10.30 in the evening, so yeah, it's a bit late. Uh, but I'm happy to be with you. So I hope uh, you, can all, uh, you can all hear me well, not my slides. Um, if not, let's, let me know, and maybe you can address it. So, but, okay, so this presentation um, is about um, defining simple sampling strategies for digital soil mapping. So this is really about uh, geostatistics, but I tried to remove as much as I could of technicalities 
So this is just uh, an overview to give you a flavor of the topics which I'm been working on. Um, so much of the work uh, coming from this presentation uh, is from our paper published in the European Journal of Science, as you already mentioned. Um, you have the title on the reference here. So this article uh, is, is open access, so please use it and feel free to share it. Um, so this was done, uh, this work was done in, in about 2017, 2018, uh, in a collaboration uh, with Murray Lark uh, in Nottingham and Ben Marchand at the British Geological Survey. So I stayed there for a few months and work on sampling with them. So uh, the question of this presentation is uh, first, why uh, geostatistical surveys? Well, geostatistics uh, have been really uh, the mainstream framework for spatial analysis, uh, but also a synonym for digital sum mapping since about the 80s. I have put here uh, for illustration some of the benchmark articles that you can find in the literature. Uh, so you have in the left hand side uh, this is a well known article by uh, Burgess and Webster, uh, published I think in 1980. Uh, you have also some more recent articles on soil geostatistics, uh, for example, in the Pedometrics book. And of course, we have plenty of uh, textbooks. Uh, I provide you with two very good ones. Uh, they have many examples from soil science. So I just wanted to show you, but you, you surely uh, know it already, uh, that the use of geostatistics and creeding uh, is very classical, uh, not say common uh, in soil science. So now I must say that uh, this is slightly changing. Uh, we use more of machine learning algorithms uh, like super vector machine, um, neural networks, random forests, um, but geostatistics is still uh, very much used and still uh, represent the, the mainstream for digital soil mapping. So in, in this presentation, I will focus on, on geostatistics, then not machine learning, um, even if some of the simple designs that are uh, useful for geostatistical surveys may also actually be useful for mapping with machine learning. But uh, I think this still needs to be uh, a bit investigated. Uh, there are almost no studies at the moment uh, on optimal sampling for mapping with machine learning. So back to the main question of this presentation. Uh, why do we need simple and efficient designs uh, for soil mapping with geostatistics? So this picture uh, was taken, uh, it's from me, it was taken in 2013 during a field campaign in China. Uh, we had a study area in the Three Gorges Dam Reservoir on the Yangtze River. Uh, this is about one day of travel by boat uh, from Wuhan. So I guess no very good thing that everybody know where Wuhan is. Uh, it's in China, about the center of China, center east. But so objective there uh, was to map some key soil properties and to use these maps uh, as input uh, into an erosion model of the topsoil. So we did not have really any prior information on the source passive variability. We also did not have any uh, information on the lateral uh, soil variability in the landscape. So on, in the map on, on the left hand side, um, you can see the sampling location that we visited. Uh, they are represented with a black cross. So, you know, when, when we go sampling, uh, we need to make some decisions. So, how many soil samples we can take and where to take them? So these are two very important questions. So, in our case, we, we define the sampling location uh, using a, a sampling design called Latin APQ. So, in Latin APQ, we use a, an optimization algorithm and we need some prior information. For example, we need to know uh, which environmental variables are likely. Uh, to be correla correlated to the soil property. So we had to do um, three field campaigns. First, a reconnaissance survey, and then two surveys to actually sample and get some soil information. So, though, so there, there was really already a need uh, for uh, simple sampling strategies for mapping to avoid what we actually did, that is designing complex sampling designs uh, with optimiz optimization algorithm and, and several costly uh, campaigns uh, to obtain some soil information. So in, in geostatistics, 
uh, it is possible to use the existing correlation function of the soil, which we call the biogram, to optimize the sampling locations. So for those uh, who don't know what a, a correlation function is, it's simply a mathematical function representing the short and large-scale source spatial variability over the landscape. So this function has some parameters that we need to estimate. For example, the distance parameter uh, that tells us uh, what is uh, the maximum distance at which two values of a soil property are still correlated. Or we also have the nugget parameter, which tells us uh, how correlated are two values of a soil property at almost the same location in the landscape. So we call this correlation function a variogram. So as I said before, if we know this variogram, we can simply optimize something this before collecting the soil samples. So this is very useful. But to do this, we also need a criterion. We need to define what makes an optimal design optimal. So given my criterion and the budget, what are the optimal locations to take the soil samples? So with this, there have been a lot of studies in the literature, in the soil science literature, but also uh, in the spatial statistics literature showing that, well, we can optimize uh, the sampling design using uh, numerical techniques prior to any field survey. So I provide you here some figures from a, a reference or paper on this topic. This paper is from uh, Marchand and Lark, uh, 2007. So in figure A, you have a design uh, optimized for the Krieg invariance. So the Krieg invariance is simply uh, the prediction error variance of the geostatistical model. In figure A, the aim was simply to obtain the sampling design that gives um, the smallest prediction error variance. In figure B, uh, the Lotosh optimized a sampling design for uh, minimizing the prediction error variance, but also the uncertainty in the estimates of the variogram parameters, so two components. So what we see here about patterns, uh, we can see that in figure A, uh, we have sampling locations that are spread uh, evenly in the study area. We have very good spatial coverage of the sampling location. In figure B, this is almost the same. We have very good spatial coverage, but we note some small differences. For example, uh, we have a few points close to the other sampling locations. So figure A and B are really two very uh, common patterns that we can find in the literature on, some, on sampling design optimization or mapping. And they also make sense with what we know, because in figure A, we know that Kriging predictions, they, they benefit uh, from a good spread in the geographic space, because Kriging is simply uh, wind, a weighted average of the existing observations. So we do not want to have some parts of the study area without any observations. And figure B, it also makes sense, because these close pair points, they are there to be able to estimate this uh, short scale uh, spatial variability. But then the story is that several people have noticed that perhaps uh, we do not need to do this complex optimization procedure. So we do not need to derive uh, design A and B. We can simply spread the sampling locations in the geographic space. And also we can also uh, perhaps also add a few uh, close pair points to these uh, spatial coverage points. So this is figure C, which is very similar to figure A. But figure C has been obtained simply uh, by spatial coverage sampling, which is a very simple sampling design. Uh, it's just about spreading the sampling location in the geographic space. So it's very quick, very simple. If we add to this figure C uh, a few close pair points, then we are uh, in, a, in a situation very similar to what we can see in, uh, in figure B. So the question is, how good are actually these very simple sampling designs? So here, the sim simple sampling designs are first uh, a spatial coverage design or a spatial coverage design with about 10% of the points taken as close pairs. Are these simple sampling designs really similar to the designs obtained using complex optimization procedures? So it, it was a question we tried to answer here. Um, to answer this question, we made two scenarios. Um, the first scenario is for the case where we know the biogram, so we know this correlation function. 
And the case, uh, the second case is uh, where we do not know it. So we, we also need to have a common baseline for comparison for how do we define what is a, a best design? I already told you, we need a, a criterion to optimize and compare the sampling design. So this criterion, uh, this is very common one as well. It's simply uh, the total error of a map made by geostatistical model. So we can use this total error of the, to optimize the sampling design and to compare this optimized design to some very simple designs. So this total error is composed of two terms. This is a question that you see. I already mentioned them before. The first term is the prediction error variance. That's the sigma square of ordinary Kriegian. So it's simply the prediction or variance. We want the variance of the prediction to be as small as possible. And the second term, uh, this is the expectation of the variogram parameter uncertainty. So we want to also minimize the uncertainty uh, in the estimation of this correlation function. So both terms, uh, they are spatial. So we want them uh, exhaustively for all locations. Uh, in the study area. This is the S that you see uh, in this equation. So um, from this common baseline to compare sampling designs, we can uh, develop our two scenarios. Um, our uh, simple sampling strategies comparable to optimal designs. So let us first look at the scenario in which we know the variogram parameter. This is what you are seeing now. Um, in this scenario, we have uh, I have optimized so a number of designs for different values of the parameters for an exponential variogram. So this exponential variogram it represents it represents the, the variability of my soil property. So this is really a simulation exercise. Here we do not collect any uh, any soil samples. So in the left hand side figure, you can see these optimized designs. We go from a case on the left hand side with a very strong spatial correlation. So we have a field, we simulate a field with very strong spatial correlation. And we go to uh, the right. So it's the contrary. We go from a strong spatial correlation on the right, sorry, or we go to a weaker spatial correlation on, on the left. And we go also from a distance parameter of this correlation from short uh, on the top uh, to large at the bottom. So we have nine scenarios in total. So what we see here is that in all cases, the sampling locations are more or less evenly distributed over the area with a few close pair points units. Um, the number of these close pair points units, they tend to increase as we move toward a field with a stronger spatial correlation. So this is really what you can see here. We have more uh, close pair points. Um, it also increases as we go toward a smaller distance parameter. This is what you see in this field here. We have a, a very strong uh, very, uh, cluster spatial pattern because we have a very short uh, distance parameter and also a very strong uh, spatial correlation. So this is somehow an, an expected result because we know that soil properties with a strong spatial correlation, uh, they have to be sampled at a large number of short distance locations uh, to ensure that we have minimization of of both components, uh, the variogram parameters, and also the prediction error variance. So how good are the designs that you see on the left, the optimized designs, uh, to uh, simple sampling designs? So in, fig in the figure on the right-hand side, the value of the total error, uh, this is the red triangle. The gray dots are values of a simple uh, spatial coverage sampling design. And the black dots are the values of a spatial coverage design with 10% of close pair points. So what we can see here is that the spatial coverage uh, samples, the gray dots, are always very poor uh, compared to the optimized design. They have always much higher values of the total error. But the black dots, the spatial coverage design in which we added a few close pair points, are very close to the optimal designs uh, in many cases. So this is characterized with the two black horizontal lines that you can see. They represent the number of, number of additional points that we need to reach the accuracy of the optimal uh, sampling design. Um, so what we see that in many cases, only a few, maybe five, 15 to 15 additional points, 
they are needed for the simple sampling design uh, to do as good uh, as a complex as the complex optimized design. So already here, um, with this first scenario, we can draw some conclusion that we expected. Uh, spatial coverage designs in which we added a few cluster points are almost as good as optimized sampling designs. And this relates to the first figure I show you at the beginning. Uh, we, we somehow knew it already, we expected it. But let us first, uh, let us move now for uh, the second scenario. So in this case, we do not know the values of the variogram. So we have several solutions for this. Uh, we, we can, for example, uh, we can make a reconnaissance survey. This is what we do in most of the cases. But in this case, uh, I simply computed an average variogram from previously published articles on soil geostatistics. So we have plenty of articles, and I simply use the parameters that they provide in these articles. So to simplify things, I simply use a, a compilation of uh, 25 uh, field scale soil clay variograms from uh, the study of Patterson in the pedometrics book. I gave the reference here. Um, each of these variograms, they represent the variability of the top soil clay content for one field. And uh, you can see the 25 variograms they are represented with the black lines here. And I'm not sure if you can see very well, but uh, the, the green uh, dashed line here is the, my average variogram. So of course, uh, I selected this, these variograms uh, only from um, similar soils, soils that form in similar environmental conditions. Uh, they were also all from studies uh, made on, on field scale. So I didn't use uh, variograms from uh, large scale maps. This wouldn't make a lot of sense. So from this average variogram, I simply use the methodology of similar to than similar to that that I presented for the first scenario. So I computed uh, the average variogram, uh, computed the optimized design for this average variogram. Uh, this is what you see uh, in the right hand side here on the top figure. Uh, in the figure on the bottom, I compared this total error obtained by the average variogram to uh, spatial cover sampling. So this is the gray dots, the same as before. The gray dot, this is spatial coverage sampling, and the spatial coverage sampling with close pair points, this is uh, the black dots. So here again, uh, you can see that the spatial coverage designs perform uh, very poorly until a sample size of about 200. So two times uh, the number of sampling points that we need for an optimized design to reach a similar accuracy. Uh, for the spatial coverage design with the close pair points, we only need uh, 22 points to reach the accuracy of an optimized design. So that confirms again uh, what we saw before. But now let's go uh, a bit further. Uh, is this uh, average variogram uh, robust to a large range of possible field scale soil clay variograms? So to test this, I first use the optimized uh, design of the average variogram. I calculated the number of observations that we need for simple sampling design, that is spatial coverage design with close pair points, to reach the same accuracy as the optimized design of the average variogram. So that's maybe a bit complicated to understand like this, but what you can see is that in the figure, in this figure, the colors, uh, they represent the number of points that we need to do as good as the optimized design. So the red color means that we need less points, and uh, the black color means that we need a lot more. Um, so overall, uh, we see that the optimized design of the average variogram is fairly robust uh, for most of the individual circular variograms. Um, the individual variograms in black uh, tell us that only in the case of very strong spatial correlation on short distance, we need more than 100 additional points to do as good as the average variogram. And for weaker spatial dependence, the blue or the red colors, the average variogram is generally uh, robust and can be used for sampling design optimization. So in other words, um, I think we never do, we never go very wrong uh, if we use uh, the average uh, variogram to optimize the sampling design. We can use this average variogram, for example, to, to define the optimal sampling location if we do not have any prior information on the source variability. 
So uh, this would have been very useful for my case in China, where uh, we didn't know anything about the source vessel variability, and still we needed to, to optimize um, the sampling design. So, but um, geostatistical mapping, is it always worthwhile? Uh, most of the time, we decide that we wish to do a, a soil map using geostatistical methods, but we actually forget to consider that geostatistical mapping is not always worthwhile. But we, we can also calculate this. So how do we define worthwhile first? Uh, as a basic requirement, when we do a geostatistical map, the geostatistical analysis should be uh, more accurate than a design-based estimate of the mean treated as a point prediction. So I'm sorry for, for the technicalities, but it means that we would like to do better we would like the geostatistical map to be better than simply going on the on, to the field, taking some random sampling location, and use the mean of the sampling location for all locations in the study area. For example, we go in China. In my case study, we take 100 uh, soil samples randomly, and we use the mean of the soil clay from these 100 soil samples uh, to estimate the to estimate uh, the soil clay variability in my study area. So we can calculate this. So I skip here the details, but the results are present in this table. So in green, you have some different variogram parameter values representing different possible uh, search passive probability. So these parameters, they are exactly the same as the ones uh, presented before for the first scenario. And so um, we have different values of uh, the short uh, the short range correlation the distance of the smoothness of the correlation function. Um, in red, these are the results. This is uh, the minimum number of observations that we need to make actually the geostatistical analysis worthwhile. And we do it for two, always the two simple uh, sampling design, SC that is spatial coverage, and SC plus that is uh, spatial coverage uh, with close pair points. So we can see that in some cases, for example, in the SC plus design, uh, large values of the distance parameter, the minimum number of sample location to make uh, the geostatistical analysis is very small. We only need, for example, 11 sample location uh, in a case where we have a strong spatial correlation. Um, in some other cases, can you try and draw uh, to a close, Alexander. Sorry, We're running. Can you try and draw it to a close? We're overrunning quite a lot. Yeah. Where well, is almost finished? Good. Okay. So uh, we we can see or show that for the case of spatial coverage design, we need more than 200 sampling locations to do as good as optimized design. So uh, what does it tell us? Again, uh, I can see here that adding a few close pair points makes the geostatistical analysis much more accurate. So simply adding a few close pair uh, units do not really increase. Uh, the total cost of the survey, but we really greatly improve uh, the accuracy of the map. So just to summarize, uh, can we use sampli simple sampling designs for geostatistical mapping? The answer is yes, uh, but not all of them are useful. Uh, if you know already the variogram, you can use it to optimize the sampling design, uh, or you can take a, simply a spatial coverage design and add a few close pair points. Um, if you do not know the variogram, you can also simply take a spatial coverage sampling design with a few close pair points. Um, so overall conclusion, little evidence of optimizing sampling design. So don't do it. It's too much time. It's very complicated. Uh, simply uh, use a simple sampling design for just statistical mapping. Most of the time, uh, these sampling designs are so efficient uh, for mapping with machine learning. So do not worry too much about this. And so this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed it and I didn't, didn't go too long. Uh, if you have questions, uh, keep it for later. I will, uh, you have here my email address. And um, I realized also that I didn't share any uh, R code or how I did it uh, in the published article. So, but I'm always happy to share them. Uh, so do not hesitate to email me, uh, to ask me questions or to ask me some how to do it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander, and also for
pointing out that you're willing to share your code. I'm sure people will be interested in that. And apologies, I had to point out that we were running mm -hmm. out of time and interrupt the flow of no. the talk. And as with okay. the previous speakers, we will keep questions till the end after the next speaker. Uh, keep on typing questions so then can collect them uh, for you. So we go now over to our next speaker, our final speaker of this morning, which is John Boardman, who has been invited by our soil use and management editor, Dr. Deyu Hu. Uh, soil use and management is issued quarterly with approximately 75 papers published annually. John's article, Off-site impacts of soil erosion and runoff, why connectivity is more important than erosion rates, was first published in January 2090 and was the editor's choice for today's presentation. John Portman is a geomorphologist educated at the University of Kiel and London. John retired from the Environmental Change Institute in September 2008 and from his position as Deputy Director of ECI, Director of MSC in Environmental Change and Management. He is now an Emeritus Fellow at the ECI, Research Fellow at Green Templeton College, Oxford and at the Department of Geography, University of the Free State, Bloemfontein, South Africa. He's a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and the British Society of Geomorphology. He's published over 160 papers, mainly on land degradation, and has edited several books. John was chairman of the EU-funded Cost Action 623, Soil Erosion and Global Change from 1998 to 2003, with 21 participating countries and chaired a working group in cost 634 on and off-site impacts of runoff and erosion. He is UK representative on the cost uh, European Cooperation in Science and Technology Transdisciplinary Proposal Standing Assessment Board and on the Earth System Science and Environmental Management Committee. John continues to work on soil erosion in southern England and on land degradation in South Africa. Over to you, John. We look forward to hear your presentation. Um, thank you. I hope I can be, be heard now. Yes. Yes, and Natalie is going to um, organise my slides when I tell her, I believe. So I'm going to be talking about erosion and runoff and connectivity. I'd first want to acknowledge uh, collaborators, uh, Carol van Dahl from Flanders in Belgium, where they're doing great work on mitig mitigation, mitigating the effects of erosion. Um, Ian Foster from the University of Northampton and Bob Evans at Cambridge, who I've worked with for approximately 40 years. Um, next slide, please. So off-site damage is caused by muddy runoff from agricultural fields. Muddy flooding affects properties and roads and affects freshwater systems, streams and rivers, causing ecological damage due to phosphorus and pesticides attached to fine particles. Note the introduction of sediment into formerly gravel bedded rivers and its impact on fish breeding. In Belgium, the costs of muddy flooding are estimated at between 16 and 160 million euros per year, depending on the severity of the weather and land use impacts, of course. Next, please. Uh, a couple of pictures from uh, recent flooding in the small town of Reemst in, in, in Flanders. Um, this is muddy flooding. I want to emphasize that this type of flooding is nothing to do with rivers or with coastal uh, situations. It's to do with runoff from farmers' fields, from agriculture, bringing with it soil, thus the muddy element of the flooding. Next, please. The cleanup operations are often complex and costly, because, uh, especially when it gets into houses, because um, mud is more difficult to deal with than clean water. Next, please. A lot of our um, information from Flanders is based on the fire brigade because the fire brigades fire brigades are responsible for cleaning up after uh, muddy flood events 
and they keep good uh, data and thus we can get down to costs of muddy flooding and when it happens and where it happens. Uh, so this is valuable data. It's something that we don't, for example, have in, in Britain. Um, next, please. So this is a, an erosion risk map for Flanders. In the uh, urban area you see at the top of the image is actually Reemst, which you've just seen pictures of um, with muddy flooding in 2016. The uh, red and purple fields are those classified as at highest risk. The uh, yellow and green are the lowest risk of erosion. So this is done on a field by field basis using the revised soil loss equation for what it's worth. Um, and this gives us a imp impact on individual fields. Uh, next, please. An erosion risk map such as that which I've just shown you is of value in predicting the risk of erosion on a particular field. It's a very limited value in predicting the risk of off-site damage, for example, to reefs. For this, we need to include the elements of connectivity, both topographic and anthropogenic, which I will explain. Next, please. This, these are maps of France, and on the left, is the uh, a map of soil erosion uh, risk on in particular departments the uh, green and yellow are the low risk areas and the key which you probably can't read says that those uh, are below one ton per hectare per year that's the yellow and green but on the right we have um, a map of the density of muddy floods in france now I want you to just notice the northern French areas where the risk of erosion on fields is low, i.e. below one ton per hectare per year, whereas the number of muddy floods that have occurred in that area, where the dark red and light red, is high. So what I want to stress here is the lack of correlation between uh, high erosion or low erosion rates and the occurrence of muddy floods is clearly not a good correspondence. Next, please. Connectivity. The degree of connectivity of the fields and urban area or the river is likely to be more important than the absolute rates of erosion on the field. That is my contention, at least. Predicted rates of erosion on fields are not good predictors of the risk of off-site damage. Connectivity will be composed of topographic concentration lines, such as dry valleys and depressions in fields, and anthropogenic elements. Next, please. Now, these anthropogenic elements are important, and they consist of tracks, roads, sunken lanes, ditches, drains under roads, culverts, etc. Field boundary failures, field boundaries can be permeable or semi-permeable, field gateways, also, under drainage of fields and tillage direction on fields. And I'm not going to consider those two aspects of connectivity in this presentation. So this is a list of anthropogenic elements, what uh, humans have, have done to agriculture areas which relate to connectivity. Next, please. So example, I'm just going to give you a few examples of connectivity with pictures. Uh, but in terms of mitigation, which I'll come to a bit later, it's worth stressing that what we will want is discontinuity. We we'll want to break down connectivity, prevent connectivity causing damage. <coughs> Next, please. Um, so this is a very simple example of connectivity between a field at the top and a sunken lane. So runoff, muddy runoff coming down the bank into the sunken lane. Next, please. And then it progresses down the sunken lane uh, towards the river in the distance. So this is an example from Cambridgeshire, a very simple example, just showing how connectivity between fields, rivers, and in some cases, urban area areas can um, operate. Next, please. This is a more dramatic example, a more catastrophic example of uh, runoff from a post-harvest maize field 
field, which often give problems uh, if they're not properly managed, through an open gateway into a sunken lane, and then again down the sunken lane, following the gradient towards urban areas or rivers. And this is an example from the Environment Agency in, in Somerset, England. Uh, gateways can clearly be moved, but you don't often find examples of that. They could be moved to better locations so that you're not getting runoff through the gateways. Next, please. <coughs> um, the Rother Valley, West Sussex, I've been working in this area with my collaborators for many years now. So this is an example from 1914, February, on a winter cereal field with, with a, probably about 30 to 40 percent cover at this time, vegetation cover, during a small storm between 20 and 30 millimeters in the day. And we see an ephemeral gully uh, uh, formed in the field, crossing the field, moving sediment and uh, muddy, muddy water with sediment uh, towards where I'm taking the photograph. Next, please. And the question here is, is the field connected? And the, the answer is in this picture where the ephemeral gully arrives, often leaves the field and uh, flows into a recently cleaned ditch, um, a very efficient conductor of runoff away from the field, good for field drainage, but not so good for um, connectivity. The ditch flowing towards me, uh, leads directly into the river Rother. The Rother is just beyond the hedge you see on the right. So we've got very good connectivity here between the winter cereal field via the ditch uh, and into the river Rother. Next, please. This is a Google Earth image from 2001 from the same area from West Sussex, and it shows surprising amount of connectivity between uh, almost bare uh, fields probably being prepared for spring cereals a bit later. Um, and note the traces of runoff and sediment in many cases passing through field boundaries, <coughs> edges. Now this is uh, quite, quite surprising to many people because often they regard field boundaries and hedges as, per, as impermeable. That is not always the case. In fact, in the Rother Valley, it's not often the case. Um, we get runoff frequently moving through hedges because they're not efficiently maintained or they're not thick enough. And this was a case dur during a rather wet winter, 2001, in the Rother Valley. The flows are to the bottom of the picture, the south, uh, onto a lane and then um, off the picture, this, these flows carrying muddy water continue through another couple of fields and again reach the river rather. So we've got again another pollution event affecting the river. Next, please. Connectivity between fields is not necessarily regarded on maps or on remotely sensed images. Um, the latter example I've just shown you was an exception. For example, the presence or condition of ditches, culverts, under roads, and the permeability of hedges, these issues, these factors are not recorded on maps and rarely on remote sensed images. It's cert certainly, that is, connectivity is not addressed by available soil erosion models, for example, the erosion risk map of Flanders that I showed previously. Actual or potential connectivity has to be addressed by field surveys, ideally by observations during runoff events. Remote sense images may be helpful, but they have to be taken at critical times, and that may not often be the case. Next, please. These are three examples from the Rother Valley of sample areas where we've mapped uh, connectivity between fields and the River Rother, the blue line at the bottom of these images. In A, the uh, mapped routes across fields are shown with uh, blue dotted lines. And what happens is that the runoff goes beneath the road in a culvert and then into the, uh, into the uh, um, 
the stream on the other side of the road and to the river. In the example on B, we've got flow from a series of fields and then down a sunken lane. It says along the lane here and then into the rather uh, at Stedham Bridge. Uh, in C, we've got flow from another series of fields uh, down a main road. This is this red line down through the urban area of Midhurst into a small stream and into the rother. Um, so these are observed cases of uh, connectivity in the last few years between sets of fields, or in all cases involving passage of water and sediment through field boundaries and via various routes, sunken lanes, roads, small streams into the rother. Next, please. Um, what we've done is mapped fields with a history of erosion since 1987 using various databases in the Rother Valley. And we've got nearly 200 now in the database with a known history of erosion. So erosion has occurred on all these dots and triangles on this map in the last 30 or so years. Um, the sample areas are shown in, in yellow that I've just been referring to. Um, what I want you to notice is that of the 165 fields on this map, they're all relatively close to the rother because this is where the arable areas are located in the valley. Of these 165 fields, um, just over 100 are potentially connected to the river. So a large proportion of these fields with a history of erosion are potentially connected to the river. And at certain times and in certain circumstances, they have been connected. So this is quite a quite a, a number of uh, issues um, related to connectivity and related to the <coughs> the river rather itself. Next, please. So a few words about mitigation. Um, if we put the emphasis on connectivity as a cause of off-site damage, we need mitigation measures to address this challenge. For example, buffer strips, grass waterways, retention ponds. It will not be good enough to simply rely on on-field measures such as conservation tillage, as they serve a different purpose. Next, please. A particular problem is the loss of fine sediment, that is less than um, 63 microns, from fields and from detention structures. These are often able to travel, that's the fine sediments, in suspension, long distances, and reach watercourses. They have a potential to pollute. Next, please. This is a, 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 an example of a detention structure in the Rother Valley uh, constructed about 10 years ago uh, to detain water, muddy runoff from fields on the right, and protect the houses that you see behind the bank and the uh, hedge. It's been overtopped once, to my knowledge, in the last 10 years and that caused damage to the garden and the swimming pool of the house. Um, so the question here is, how, how is it drained? Because clearly if it's not drained during large rainfall events, flooding will occur. Next, please. And the answer is that for many years it, it wasn't drained because the, the ditch leading out of it, which you see in the foreground, um, the trench, was a, a dead end. So it was recently decided to extend this ditch beyond the picture through woodland. And what you see in the distance is a surveyor checking the gradient which the, which the ditch will need to drain this, uh, the water from the detention structure, which I've just shown. Um, in fact, this extension has now been um, constructed and it goes past where the surveyor is standing, through the woodland, and unfortunately, directly into the river rather. So what we're doing, doing here is solving one problem of protecting the, the house, his garden, and the swimming pool, and creating another by feeding uh, runoff with fine sediment associated with it into the river rather. This is an example of what has been called pollution swapping, where you solve one pollution problem or damage problem and create another. 
So we've got to think a bit more uh, carefully um, about where we drain detention structures, just such as the one I've just shown. Next, please. Uh, retention ponds in Flanders uh, can be very efficient and uh, if well constructed and they're well thought through. These are examples which are working well. Next, please. <clears throat> and this is another approach to the problem, uh, emer an emergency measure using straw bales to prevent eroded soil on the field in, in the left distance. Uh, passing out of the field and damaging properties and watercourses, freshwater watercourses. Um, quite efficient, it won't last too long, but it, it acts efficiently for a short, this short time. Next, please. Alternative approaches are being shown, are being developed. In this case, runoff and sediment is actually being stored on a road rather than allowing it to. Um, proceed and damage and threaten properties and watercourses. Again, this is in Flanders, very recently constructed. Next, please. Right, just to sum up, uh, connectivity between the field and the river or an urban area may be far more important than an erosion rate. Connectivity needs to be assessed by field observation aided by remote sensing, this can be useful, because many elements of connectivity are not apparent on maps or in models. Mitigation measures, I would say, take care, especially because of the loss of fine sediments. Thank you. If you want to look more information, I've, um, next please, there's a series of references that relate mainly to work we've done in Flanders and the Rother Valley. Thank you. I think I'm just within my 20 minutes. Thank you very much, John, for this presentation. And just as a reminder to the audience that um, you'll be able to access both John's and Alexander's articles through our website. Um, so please have a look at those and take an extra read if uh, you want to digest the information in greater detail. So we will now go straight into questions. So we will skip this comfort break, which is coming up now, and we'll move to the questions. So over to Dan, who has been collecting the questions for our four speakers. Thank you very much, Wilfred, and uh, thank you to our three speakers. Uh, we've just got time here for one question to each, so I'll go through as uh, uh, on the schedule. Uh, and first to Martin, uh, who's here with us. Uh, so Martin, thank you for your talk this morning. Should a soil resource and management plan be a statutory requirement for all construction projects? And the uh, delegate here asking, this might reduce the amount of mucking away and mixing and dumping of topsoil and subsoil. So sh should a management plan be a statutory requirement for construction projects? Yeah, but, um, there's, there's different ways that we can tackle this. I mean, you can um, provide a, a stick or a carrot. Um, I think in uh, many aspects, uh, soil uh, a moving of soil is one of the costliest aspects of any any job so i think actually a commercial aspect and incentive would be a better mechanism uh with the um uh with the undercurtain of uh of legislative action so i think you know trying to place a, a an incentive uh to reuse material every project will have a material management plan of some sort or other uh, whether they'll regard it as a material management plan or a soil management plan uh, might be another thing, but they're sort of doing it. It's perhaps just recognising that what they are doing and just the, the, the extra mile they'd need to go to make sure they dot the I's and cross the T's uh, to reuse that material with incentive in the correct manner. And if they don't, that there's some sort of bond or um, uh, tie-in that they would have to surrender if they weren't compliant. And, and yeah. I think if that were in place commercially, that would very much sharpen the uh, the attention and drive the right behavior. And that's that's clearly, yeah, with the landfill tax, that's one example where, you know, an incentive mechanism through law works well. Now, whether you'd have to put it through law or not, uh, money talks. 
to do the right thing. <laughs> indeed, right thing. indeed it does. Yeah, indeed it and does. It, I think it was great seeing John's uh, presentation because yeah, there's so much commonality that I saw there with some of the images and the runoff risk. And yeah, that should be seen as a cost, a cost to the landowner and a cost to the developer. Uh, is again, how do we commercialise that that risk and liability to the environment, both downstream on uh, flooding risk or aquatic ecology risk, um, as as we've seen recently on the River Lug uh, and the, uh, the the terrible news uh, that's been seen there with a the landowner who's stripped out the uh, the verge side of a river. Uh, the impact of that downstream is clearly evident now, but there's plenty of developers that do do that unwittingly because they think it's good for their land or they're doing it for you know for what they'd see as a good reason but it has a cost and unless unless we can demonstrate that commerciality uh then we're not going to get the right behavioral traction yeah of course well thank you martin and thank you for your presentation uh we move on to now to alexandra uh and we've got a question here would you say that traditional soil surveying is a form of human human learning rather than machine learning for soil mapping so maybe a more of a conceptual question uh underline your, your work there alexandra yeah so um ha huh, it's, it's not a simple question because it's something we, we often talk uh, between colleagues uh what to do because uh yeah what to do if we do not want to do a map with uh, all these techniques of statistics and machine learning uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't have a good answer in mind, and since we have no much time, I think uh, it's better if I if I just keep it, uh, because I will not say something very intelligent here. <laughs> but yeah, um, well, that's a very honest approach. Uh, I'm, uh, sure that, um, to, I'm sure that I'm sure that people can find more time you, to, to the next speaker. <laughs> of course, absolutely. I'm sure people can email questions in. At, uh, as that's the case for all of our speakers uh, this oh, afternoon. Exactly. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, Alexandra, for that, and I appreciate that. And, and finally, for John uh, here, and thank you for your talk, John, as well. Uh, many erosion risk maps suggest a very low risk for the UK compared to other regions in Europe. Uh, this has driven policy decisions and research priorities have overlooked erosion as a threat in the UK. So what are your views on this, John? I think... <laughs> The, the maps are probably pretty accurate. Um, we have erosion risks in certain areas, and I've been showing you, and I can be accused of um, of showing the dramatic pictures rather than the everyday pictures, of course. Um, but in certain areas on erodible soils, as in the Rother Valley, we have regular erosion every year. In certain years, like 2001 and 2006, we had extremely uh, severe erosion. So erosion in Britain is intermittent tem temporarily and it's um, not in all places. It's on the erodible soils which we, we know where they are. Bob Evans did a great job many years ago in telling us for each soil association how to classify it, this was 1990, for erosion risk and, and that's still a, a, a very valuable contribution he made. Just one final point if I have time. Um, Martin's point about costs is is very interesting. In the Rother Valley, most of the uh, obvious costs are borne by southern water because they are taking water out of the Rother for human consumption and at very considerable cost having to clean that water, take out pesticides, uh, phosphates and phosphorus and uh, sediment. There are other costs that are borne by the angling community because of the damage to fish populations. Thanks. No, thank you, John, and, and thank you to Martin. Uh, and I'm afraid that we've, we've run out of time for, for okay. further discussion. The highway uh, got uh, got an issue with it as well, with uh, the verge being yeah. cut up. That's I'm true. Sure. Yeah. Yes. That is true, and I see it in, in my home county of Norfolk as well. Thank you, Martin, John, and, and Alexandra as well. Thank you for that, and I now hand back to Wilfred uh, for the continuation of today's programme. Thank you very much, Diane, Alexander, Martin, and John. I hope everybody enjoyed listening to these presentations, and it's a shame that we don't have more time for questions, but all the speakers have offered that you can contact them afterwards. So if your question hasn't been addressed, please contact them directly. Now we're absolutely delighted to be able to finish today's conference with the launch of two exciting projects. 
The first of these two is UK Soils, and I would like to welcome Professor Bridget Emmett, Science Area Head of Soils and Land Use at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. As with the other presentations, please type your questions for Bridget so they can be addressed at the end of the presentation. Over to you, Bridget. I don't have any sound. Okay, is that better? Yes, it is, yeah. Oh, good. All right, so um, I'm just wanting to sh share my screen and hopefully we can get going. So let me just focus on getting, do you now have a UK Soils yeah. spreadsheet? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everyone. And thanks for the chance to talk to you. And thanks for staying on. I know it's uh, a long afternoon to sit and listen to talks, but you've had some great talks and I hope I don't let everyone down there. So I just like to introduce you to this new initiative called UK Soils. And you can see there our overall ambition, which is to bring together information to inspire us all to learn more about soil and help build communities to take action to improve soil health. And we believe this is for everyone. We can't just throw this at government. We can't just throw this at farmers. It's for all of us to take more responsibility for that in our gardens, our allotments, our towns and cities, farms, woodlands, and conservation land. So who are we? Well, we are a growing group of scientific campaigning and awareness raising organizations, all with a specialist knowledge and perhaps passion, you could say, for soil health. Founding members are the UK representatives on the EU mission for soil health and food that I hope many of you are aware of. It also, the mission has, as well as the mission board, which I'm a member of, it also has an assembly. And the UK representatives, uh, the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, which I'm from, Earthwatch and the University of Sheffield, came together to try and work out how we could help promote soil health. We then asked Sustainable Soils Alliance to join us, who I'm sure many of you are aware of their amazing work. So the group is continually seeking new partners to expand the initiative's reach and engagement. And we're delighted that we've just been joined most recently by the British Soil Science Society and SRUC and many others are pending. So this is a community uh, initiative and we launched today. So why is it needed? Well, hopefully, we are all thrilled that soils do seem to be finally moving up the political agenda. And also we see it more and more on the media and uh, in the news. So there's a lot of information spread around lots of websites. It's great resource, but you have to know where to look. So what we're hoping we can do is signpost to all that material. I just really want to emphasize, we do not want to duplicate. We don't want to tread on anybody's toes. We just want to support the great work that's already out there. In addition to that, we want to create a space to bring together communities to test and create new ways of working to improve soil health. So here we're thinking very much in a transdisciplinary approach, not just farmers doing it for themselves, great job that they might do, but really trying to build communities at a local scale or regional scale to work together to link consumers with councils, with the land managers, and not just the farmers, we really need to think of as we heard that great talk about construction industry, forestry, and nature land does have its own problems. It's not immune to some of these. So the EU has a mission for soil health and food, as I mentioned. It's uh, got through the first stage and the implementation phase will happen till June 2021, but we're leaving. So how are we gonna keep engaged and how are we gonna keep tapping in to the research and innovation funding and not fall behind protecting our soils as the EU takes this forward. So here we are, you can Google us, we're live, UKSoils.org, just type it in and you'll get it up. We've worked really hard over the last eight months to bring together materials, try and make it easily and accessible, and particularly accessible to the wider community. We as academics, can it, it can be a little intimidating, some of our organization websites, and we really have worked hard and that's why some of our partners in Earthwatch and the Sustainable Soils Alliance has really helped us try and make this as accessible as possible. So how will you find things on the site? Well, one of the main things we 
tried to work on was that we appreciate that people search in different ways. So perhaps for people who soils, it's a new thing they might want to just get into. We've come up with these four uh, ways in, inspire me about soils, help me learn about soils, connect me with others working with soils, and how can I get started doing something um, for myself in my community? And if you tap on read more, it then links you to various bits of content and resources. Another way that you might find come in is to go in by what we might call topics. So I want something for, I'm interested in soils on the farm, soil in schools, soil in gardens, towns and cities. Or as you scroll down, what about soil in medicine? Many of our antibiotics, as we know, come from soil organisms. So that's the second option. If you click in here, you will then see a range of resources and we make really, really certain that everyone's logos of people who we're linking to is absolutely up there so that the recognition for the work and the resources that are being pointed to is very very clear and the final way that you can look at is just say look you know i just want a film i want an inspiring film to show my kids or to show to a set of people in the community or i'm really interested in if there's an event i can attend is there a soil music a museum we all know the one in Bargainingham, but there's also others and um, reports poems we're very keen to link up to a lot of the arts and culture that are going on in arts um, and particularly and you know things through to training courses and university degrees not all of these are full by any means we are looking for more content we're just trying to get going but hopefully there's enough in these to just entice you to help us point us suggest make suggestions and perhaps even join us as a partner so, but we're more than just a website, which was one criticism when we were trying to bid for some funding. We will also run events in 2021 with partners such as VS Cubed. And one of the things, and also have follow-up discussions in a new community forum. So this is, if you like, one of those forums where you can have threads running through, where people can go and search in those threads. And then instead of it all piling up our individual emails, people can say, well, what was the discussion about peatland restoration? What was the discussion after no-till? Can I go and read in it and then and, and learn myself and see people who are also interested in? So you could think of it as a soils mums net if you want to, but that will be launched. We're seeking funding to get that going, but we're totally committed to doing it and we hope to launch that next year. We also want to advertise what we're calling our soil health pioneers, people who in action are testing things out on the ground, in real life, in real locations. Again, we're just starting out. We've just got a few to start with. We've got an online map where you can go and just click on um, a location that's near you. And then what will pop up is some information about that site. So here there's sites about, um, it's linking to the leaf uh, farm locations, which are testing lots of different uh, management practices. And then of course, what we're hoping you'll do is go and sort of say, list my site, please. So are you involved in on the ground in farm woodland nature or indeed in towns and cities really trialing new approaches that you'd be open to people coming and asking you about it we basically would link we, we put up this limited information and then at the bottom of the screen we then say go and see the web the website that you provide us so that you get connected to people who might be interested in it so please it just takes 10 minutes to fill in the online survey we then just check it that it fits the criteria and then you'll pop up on the on the online uh, map. So these we've called them soil health pioneers, but they're actually as much lighthouses and living labs. Hopefully, some of you are aware of these um, that are coming out of the EU de definitions. Most of the research that will be funded from EU going forward will be embedded in what they call lighthouses, which are these facilities where people are demonstrating best management practices. Or the other example is living labs, where people are really pushing the boundaries and trying out new, highly innovative ways of improving soil health. In all of these, we're looking for transdisciplinary approaches, where people are talking to the local communities, talking to the policymakers, talking to the industry, as well as the academics, doing a co-creation approach. So these words, if you're at all interested in EU work, you need to get on board with this. If you're at all interested in linking into the EU, but as an approach, I think it's really relevant for us in the UK, whatever. 
So within UK Styles, we have great people uh, who are very experienced at doing citizen engagement. Not all of us are very good at this, but Earthwatch um, is terrific and they, for our launch, uh, promoted a soil art competition um, to just get people to go and touch soil, look at soil, think about soil. And here's our winner, five-year-old Max Cameron, looked at the different animals that lived in the soil, that live in the soil with his mum, and then made this fantastic picture. So these kind of activities we hope you can see, we will go right from academia through to engagement with just the next generation coming through. And we'll also partner with other organizations who perhaps aren't with us, but will come to us for experience. So there's a new animation film that just got launched today. It's called The Wonders of Soil, and it's being created by the BBC Ideas and Royal Society. And if you go onto our website and click on the link in the rolling banner, or go to uh, films and videos, you can see it. It's about four minutes long, and I think it's a very beautiful and lovely piece of animation and film that we can all use as we do our outreach activities. Also, we want to respond to the audience. Are we meeting what people want us to do? So we've got a public survey at the moment. What are the priorities in soil health for you? How do you think we should be trying to change things? It takes just 10 minutes of your time. Please go and just take the survey. Again, it's in the rolling banner on the website. Just press the button and just go through it and we will collate. And that means we also know what your interests are going forward and we can respond to that. So what will success look like? What is our goal for soil health in the UK? And that might be different for the four nations. So I just wanna share with you what the EU has come up with. You might agree with this or not agree with it and the UK will I'm sure do its own thing. But this is the very, very ambitious um, mission for soil health and food from the EU. By 2030, at least 75% of soils in each member state are healthy or show a significant improvement towards meeting acceptable thresholds of indicators to support ecosystem services. It's a massive task, but that would effectively be a doubling of soil health in Europe, because at the moment, in a new analysis that we did, we think 60 to 70% of soils in the EU are currently showing some sign of degradation um, or, or, or unhealth, non unhealthiness. So can we work together as researchers, farmers, foresters, consumers, uh, urban planners to ensure the four nations of the UK are seen as global leaders for soil health? There's our, my challenge to you all. UK soils is just part of what we need to do that, but we hope you feel it's worthwhile and you might want to contribute and you will support us. How can you become involved? So as I've mentioned, just contact us to suggest contact uh, ideas uh, additional content, uh, events, or to become a partner. Take part in our survey to track current and changing perception and priorities for soil health, and register your lighthouse, living lab, or soil assessment network so it shows up in our UK map. So with that, I will leave you with our email address and also the link to our uh, website, Community Hub, that we launched today. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bridget, for this very nice presentation and indeed for showing and sharing with us this very nice uh, initiative, very important initiative. And as a society, we're very proud to be able to support you in that. Uh, I'm looking at Dan now to see if there are any questions for Bridget. Dan, you're, you're muted. Apologies. I have one question for, for Bridget, and thank you for your presentation, Bridget. Um, obviously, we've, we've got the World Congress of Soil Science uh, coming up in, in 2022. Um, will UK soils and the programme be an inspiration for soil science societies and perhaps organisations around the world? Is this the first step to, uh, to thinking about global soil health uh, as opposed to just UK and, and Europe? Yeah, well, of course, there's the Global Soil Partnership and other initiatives going on. We would, you know, we, we just take our piece but want to link up. But I do wonder, for example, UK soils, wouldn't it be great if it was there was NL soils and DK soils? And, you know, it's part of the mission, if you read the document, that we provide these places to provide legacy for enabling people to find resources going forward and community forum and with this horrendous experience we've had the last year, we really do appreciate now that 
the real amazing potential of digital online resources. Meetings such as this, and congratulations for running this. Um, and I think going forward, yes, let's see if we can partner where countries do it for themselves, but somehow come together to do more than the sum of the parts. That would be just amazing if that could happen. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Bridget, and uh, best of luck with the programme. And, uh, and now I'm delighted to hand back to, to Wilfred for the rest of today's programme. Thank you both very much, Richard and Dan. Um, it was very nice to hear about this uh, new initiative. So we've come to the end of the presentations part for this uh, conference, but please don't switch off yet because we've got some very exciting further news uh, and uh, exciting initiative to share with you uh, in, a, in a moment. So this was the first time we had this conference online. It's been, uh, been different, but it's been very good. It's the first time we have only invited speakers at our annual conference, but I hope that you have enjoyed listening to them. It's taken us from the Roman time and using soil science to identify uh, uh, where people came from to more advanced science and forensic science to great examples of soil recovery and use and abuse and how that challenges our, our industry. And moving on to more efficient sample schemes and the science behind that and that how that's going to help us in going forward. Something that's very important to all soil scientists and also in relation to establishing our situations in relation to soil health in the UK. And finally, we had the presentation by John uh, highlighting to us the importance of connectivity in, in the landscape in relation to uh, runoff due to erosion. So uh, these were all very nice presentations and on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, I would like to express our thanks to these speakers for coming alone and present to us all day. Thank you also for the delegates for attending. You'll find a quick feedback survey when you leave it. But as I said, don't, don't, don't leave yet. Hang on for what will happen next. The recording of this video will also be made available through our YouTube channel. Uh, we will release details of our 21 event on social media in our, and in our bi-monthly email newsletter. The next edition of the Augur is due to be published next week and will be sent as part of the email newsletter on Thursday. So look out for that one. It's a bumper edition, I've been told. So I'm delighted to announce that our new website also launches today and further details of this will be included in your membership renewal letter, which will be sent by email on Monday. To end today's conference, I would like now to hand over to Sasha to tell you more about the second project launch. Over to you, Sasha. Thank you, Wilfred. Uh, thank you very much for your expert chairing this morning. Um, I look forward to taking on the role of chair of the annual conference next year, as is our tradition in the society. This is something done by the outgoing president. So thank you very much for that today. Um, special thanks to Dan uh, in his role as our, our question and reporter. Um, really appreciate that, Dan. Fantastic work, as always. Uh, and also special thanks to both Sarah and Natalie, uh, our backroom office, who put in a huge amount of work to be able for us to deliver this meeting today uh, and so slickly. So special thanks to them. So as Wilfred has said, uh, we've been engaging on a lot of exciting things in the last few months with the World Congress and our new website uh, available tomorrow um, and our Zoom into seminar series. Uh, and we have one more thing which we are really excited to launch today, um, which is our new campaign, uh, Hashtag Grounded. Um, and we're going to launch this with a short video, um, but rather than myself introduce it, I would like to hand over to our Executive Officer, Sarah Gary, because she has really been the, the driving force for the delivery of this. So um, well done. I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, and without further ado, over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sasha, for that introduction. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to be able to share Grounded with you. Um, the video aims to raise public awareness of soil health and it's perfect timing for us to be able to launch this ahead of World Soil Day. It offers a really important message to share, particularly as Dan mentioned earlier, 
as we lead up to the World Congress of Soil Science in 2022. Um, to make sure the public were really engaged with this topic, we knew that we needed some people that were familiar to them uh, to be involved. So as well as the notable soil scientist Jane Rickson, who you will know, um, and uh, Natalia Falligan, a fellow in food science and technology at Cranfield University, we have worked closely with TV wildlife presenter and biologist Lizzie Daly, uh, along with Ed Shaw from Riverford Organics and Tolga Ak Aktas, a biologist and social media influencer. The video is accompanied by a call to action on our new society website, which provides practical ways for any member of the public to support their soil health and prevent its degradation at a local level. Hashtag Grounded is the first part of this journey and we really look forward to developing further material to support the campaign over the coming year. Um, and so on that note, it really is my pleasure to be able to end the conference with the first official public viewing of Grounded before it's released tomorrow. So over to you, Natalie, to play the video. Thank you very much. Everything that we do ultimately comes from soil. I mean, you know, without soil, there is no life. The soil is crucial to us and it's, you know, it's the core of what we do. It's got so much life and vigor, tens of thousands of microorganisms per square meter of, of healthy soil. You know, it's, it's an entire world. Before the 20th century, soil was largely down to food and agriculture, right? But now we're starting to understand how they play a role in our ecosystems and why that's so valuable. For a young scientist to actually, in this particular climate, understand what the biggest issues are, you know, some of the biggest global issues currently to do with our climate and the state of our planet, soil's actually at the heart of that. Often people think of soil as just that brown, muddy stuff. But in England and Wales alone, there are over 700 different types of soils. Um, and even if you just think, well, there are sandy soils and clay soils and silt soils, peat soils, but there are so many. All those soils deliver different goods and services to society. They go on to support so many of the species that we spend time going out to photograph or seeing or learning about. So it leaves me to question and us to question how we're going to actually make a difference now to avoid that whole chain collapsing. If we have soils that are degraded, that's going to affect on our health and that's key for everybody. Urban growing affects very positively the well-being of uh, the citizens. Right now, where we are looking at is that it not only affects the food production, but also society. At the end of the day, people are going to connect to things that, you know, benefit them. Unless you're not outdoors or physically, you know, doing stuff like planting and growing your own things, you have to really know that it's there. You have to really know its importance and its values for you to really appreciate it. It's not something that is independent and isolated, and we sometimes just walk on it and don't worry about it. But if without a healthy soil, we are not going to have healthy food, we are going to have a higher impact of climate change, and we are going to have that quality of water and air. Something will connect you with soils in some way. Bottom line is that we estimated that the annual costs of soil degradation just in England and Wales are 1.2 billion pounds a year. And so what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, if we want to stop that degradation, we should be spending at least 1.2 billion pounds on trying to protect soils from those processes. If we don't have a healthy soil today or tomorrow, then the impact won't be seen for a few years, but in a generation's time, um, everyone will be ruining you know, what we haven't done and the opportunities we've missed. We currently are at a tipping point for our soil, for the environments that make up you know, some of the most wild and beautiful landscapes that we love and know, the prairies, the grasslands and wetlands and peat bogs. That being said, it doesn't mean that I'm not optimistic about what can be done. It's just a case of implementing that change that's necessary. It's a combination of 
you know, existing researchers and new researchers, the younger generation. But we have to all work together to really make the difference. Our life depends on soil. It's crucially part of who we are and how we live, so we need to do everything we can to protect it.